Okay, brilliant. Well, thanks, Masood, for inviting me to participate in this wild snake ecology uh, seminar, virtual seminar series. Um, I'm going to talk today mostly about a couple of experiments that I did as part of my postdoctoral research at the University of Geneva. Um, this was a project that was very much stimulated by the recent renewed interest in venomous snake bite um, as a neglected tropical disease at the sort of global public health level. Um, you may not be aware, particularly if you come from um, a country where a snake bite is not really a big problem, like the United States or Europe, that um, many, many people are bitten and envenomated by venomous snakes every year. The best estimates suggest that there's something like um, 5 million snake bites a year, uh, about 100,000 of which may be fatal, and about four times that many may lead to long-term disability, um, which is quite a, a large toll. You know, that's for some perspective, because that's really, those are big numbers. That's more than rabies, uh, which is a disease that a lot of people have heard of. And at first, I was kind of not really used to thinking about snake bite as a disease because, of course, it's not a communicable disease, but it does have a lot of other similarities with diseases and disorders, um, particularly that afflict you know, some of the regions of the world. So that's what stimulated a lot of the research that you're going to see today. Um, I actually met some of my collaborators through Facebook, through a Facebook group that I administrate called snake identification or co-administrate I should say together with a large team of very dedicated people um, and they invited me to come to Geneva and contribute my expertise in snake identification and snake ecology and snake uh, biodiversity to their kind of global health public health cause so I spent 16 months there working on these projects and our, our objective was really to try and develop better tools for healthcare workers in the field and also for patients to identify snakes in a snake bite case. Sometimes that's helpful clinically because it helps you decide whether or not um, to seek treatment, whether or not you need antivenom, and if so, sometimes what type of antivenom that you need. And it's also helpful for an epidemiology perspective because um, the, the statistics on snake bite and kind of the global data on snake bite are not very rich with snake identifications. A lot of snakes in snake bite cases are never seen, or if they are, they're not identified. And if they are, sometimes they're not identified correctly. So uh, it's hard to do sort of retrospective studies and ask questions like, does this antivenom work well against this species, or does it work well um, in this part of the species range? Because we just don't have any idea a lot of the time what snakes are biting people. So um, we hoped that out of this research would come some useful information. And, and this is still all in kind of an early stage. Uh, the World Health Organization did place snake bite on its list of neglected tropical diseases last year, and it was just sort of gathering a lot of momentum and attention. Uh, there's now a snake bite roadmap that is going to be presumably followed over the next 10 years to increase research and development of snake bite, everything from developing new antivenoms to new ways to distribute them to some of the diagnostic tools that I'll talk about today. Um, you know, to the extent to which all of that will be eclipsed by coronavirus, I think, remains to be seen. But this was a very hot topic within the World Health Organization and um, other collaborators, which you can see there at the bottom of the screen, the University of Geneva Hospital, um, the non-governmental organization Doctors Without Borders, and our collaborators at um, EPFL, the University of Zurich, and Kurt Mapper and the Indian Snake Bite Initiative, um, India being the country with the most number of snake bites globally every year, we think. So um, with that, I'm going to sort of step back for just a minute and give you a brief introduction to who I am. Um, so I was born in New York. I grew up in North Carolina, where I became active in the North Carolina Herpetological Society through volunteer work I did at the Museum of Natural Sciences in Raleigh um, as a teenager. And that kind of kindled my interest in reptiles and amphibians, which I pursued at the University of Georgia, where I uh, did a bachelor's degree in ecology. I moved to Illinois for my master's degree, also in uh, biology, and then out to Utah for my PhD. And um, I would be remiss if I didn't thank my uh, two advisors, my master's thesis supervisor, Steve Mullen, and my PhD supervisor, Susanna French, for their um, 
unending support of my various pursuits, many of which were not related to what I was meant to be working on at the time. Um, they were very patient with me, and I really appreciated and continue to appreciate everything they've done for me. Um, after I defended my PhD, uh, we took kind of a side trip to Europe, um, which I'll go to in just a minute. Um, and we've been there for the last four years, and I just moved back to the United States in uh, December of last year, and I'm now an assistant professor at Florida Gulf Coast University in Fort Myers, Florida. Um, just wrapped up my first semester of teaching, very unique first semester, to say the least. Um, so at the University of Georgia, I became quite interested in the ecology of aquatic snakes, and I did a couple of studies there, one looking at quantifying detection probability and occupancy of aquatic snakes inhabiting wetlands, and we know that snakes can be really hard to find, and we sort of were able to put some numbers on just how hard to find they can be, um, which is very. Uh, we also, uh, this sort of kindled my initial interest in snake diet studies and looking at what different species of snakes ate in different places and at different times, and doing some kind of comparative ecology um, in more permanent versus more ephemeral wetlands. When I moved to Illinois, I was still very much thinking about what snakes eat, and I wanted to refocus on sort of behavioral ecology for my masters. So I started looking at hognose snakes, and I looked at um, two aspects of their ecology for my thesis. The first was their unique defensive behavior, where they they flip over on their back, and play dead, and we were able to show that there were relatively consistent differences in the wild in um, the amount of time that hognose snakes played dead for. Okay, so yes, yeah, so for my masters, I looked at um, the defensive behavior of these snakes, but also what they ate using um, a technique called stable isotopes. And so this allowed me to really get into physiology for the first time, which is what I spent a large part of my dissertation working on. I work mostly on lizards, but I won't um, talk about that today. I'll just mention that I was fortunate enough to continue doing a little bit of side work on snakes, um, looking at the uh, genetic adaptations that snakes that eat toxic prey have. Um, together with Al Savitsky, who's here today, as well as um, Butch Brody, Chris Feldman, and others uh, who sort of pioneered the garter snake newt system. Um, we were interested in, in fact, the hognose snakes seem to be able to do sort of the same thing, but they don't use the same genetic mutations to do it, and we still don't know what mutations they use. Um, I also applied the same type of stable isotope technique to measuring the diet of garter snakes in Oregon, where they're highly resistant to toxic newts, and we found that actually they don't eat newts all that often, they eat mostly other things, which is kind of interesting and something that we should have published by now and we haven't gotten around to, but we will um, hopefully, have, hopefully I'll have time to get back to that data set soon. Um, and many of you may also know that I write or wrote this blog, Life is Short But Snakes Are Long. Um, this is a blog that I wrote from 2012 until about 2017 when I moved to Europe. and. I took sort of a short break at that time, and I've never really gotten back to it, which is one of my biggest regrets. I really loved writing it, and I still have a ton of ideas for new content to put up there. Um, but it was a lot more popular than I ever anticipated. So um, I still get an average of about 500 visits a day on this blog, and that's a total uh, totaling 1.6 million since 2012, since I started it. So really amazing. Um, you can see there's kind of a seasonal cycle that has established where I think more people just search the Internet on snakes during the um, summer in the northern hemisphere when they're more likely to see snakes and want to know something about them, which is a bit interesting. But I did this because um, what I really tried to do here was provide well-referenced, reputable information about snakes that wasn't available elsewhere uh, to synthesize and really try to translate information from the peer-reviewed literature into terms that were more easily understandable for the general public or an amateur with a great deal of interest. And finally, really this probably should be number one, is to indulge my own broad interests in different aspects of snake ecology that I wasn't working on uh, in my research at the time, but which I wanted to know more about. So one day I'd like to get back to this. I sort of promised myself that if I didn't get a postdoc in 2018 that I would um, start writing the blog again and think about turning it into a book. And I did get a postdoc in 2018, and then I promised myself again in 2019 that if I didn't get an academic job, I would get back blog and turned it into a book, and then I was extremely fortunate to get an, uh, an academic job in 2019, so um, it could be a while before I get back to this, but I, I do intend to do that someday. Um, a quick detour to some work that I did kind of as a contractor for the University of North Carolina Greensboro, um, which precipitated the work that I'll mostly talk about today. 
this is a visual learning software for amphibians and reptiles that I help them develop, mostly by sort of validating that their images are identified, helping them out a little bit with the taxonomy. Um, and what I learned from this really is that um, the way that people identify organisms or anything uh, when they're experts in identifying that thing is not what you might think. And um, that is, they don't use the characteristics of those organisms. So when you look up in a field guide, you know, how do I tell uh, a ribbon snake from a garter snake? It'll tell you, well, ribbon snakes have, you know, a cream colored stripe on dorsal scale rows three and four, and garter snakes have it on scale rows one and two, and ribbon snakes have unstriped lips, and garter snakes have striped lips. The experts don't actually always need to refer to those characteristics if they're just making a, a first impression off the cuff identification of a snake or anything from a photograph. Instead, what they do is they identify it by what the Germans call gestalt, uh, which is a word that's not 100% translatable, but it sort of means like what something looks like. And um, the same regions of the brain actually are activated in experts when they're asked to identify something that they're an expert as are activated when we identify people by their faces. When you think about it, it kind of makes sense. There is no way that you could describe to me the face of your mother in such a way that I could pick her out from a lineup of similar looking people. It just can't be done. We don't use characteristics to identify other humans by their faces. We just get to know them and what they look like. And you can't really transfer that information very easily. Um, so, so I was kind of interested in this. I didn't think it would really go anywhere. Um, but I ended up using this a little bit as a precursor for, for what I'll mostly talk about, which is trying to quantify how good people are at identifying snakes and how quickly they can do it and comparing it to uh, other tools that are used in snake and organism identification today. So you can check this out if you want. This covers the 10 um, states of the southeastern U.S. It's got every species of amphibian and reptile, and it's kind of like a flashcard software that you can use to train yourself to ID those species um, if you want to try to learn them better. Okay, so I mentioned uh, we moved to Europe. We lived for a time in Jena, Germany, where my um, wife, Kendall Morris, was a PhD student at the Planck Institute for Biogeochemistry. Um, I was happily working there as a scientific editor when I met folks from the Institute of Global Health at the University of Geneva, and they invited me to um, apply for funding together with them. And when we were granted that funding, they invited me to come work for them as a postdoc. So that's sort of where I started, and that's where I'll pick up now. So if you're a snake person, you've probably been asked to identify a snake before. It is literally the most common question that I get. Um, and sometimes people will show you images like this. You know, I saw this while I was walking my dog. Could I please get a positive ID on it? It was close to a small creek. <laughs> but, you know, I think there may be a snake in there somewhere, but uh, I certainly couldn't tell you where um, or, or what species it is. And um, it doesn't stop there. You know, I got this email one day. I'm sorry for bothering you on a Sunday. Did you happen to know what species of snake this is? I found the skin by my neighbor's pond in New York. I tried to look it up, but did not find a match. Obviously, it's not a snake skin at all, but some piece of plastic junk. Um, so we may not be able to help these people, but we probably can help um, other people. And in particular, it got me thinking about resources that are available for identifying snakes online. And, and some of them are really abysmal. You know, we had several people in our search for snake images to use in these experiments. We had several people tell us, well, why don't you just use Google, you know? And um, if you, you know, the reason we don't do that is that if you Google something like uh, baby copperhead, you'll see that fully 50% of the top 10 images are actually not copperheads, right? And um, it gets worse than that, depending on who's really vetted the images. Um, you know, copperheads are back, right? <laughs> like this is someone's pet ball python that's um, been staged in their backyard, I guess. I don't know if the news channel knew that or not. Um, but some of these are truly hilarious. Uh, you know, this one is more, you'd have to have a little bit more expertise to see what's wrong with this one. Um, this is from PetSmart. Uh, this is, they're trying, trying to tell you how to care for your rough green snake, um, which is a, a non-venomous uh, insect-eating snake from North America, but the picture of a venomous pit viper from 
Southeast Asia, which is rough and green, but not the rough green snake that I think they mean. Uh, at least I hope they're not selling these at the Petco. I really like this one because this is from a museum display showing how to tell poisonous snakes from non-poisonous snakes. Of course, you look at the shape of their pupil and whether or not they have heat sensing pits in their face. Um, whoever put this together probably did not realize that the lower image is of a king cobra, uh, which is a lot more dangerous probably than the rattlesnake. And um, this all seems maybe sort of hilarious and like fun and games. And as, as a herpetologist, I can tell you that it really is. And there are some hilarious stories. Um, but it could be a matter of life or death if one of these snakes has just bitten you, right? So this is from kind of a Red Cross um, guidebook. And you can see that you've got sort of your rattlesnakes on top, coral snakes on the bottom, cotton mouths. And then if you take your cotton mouth and turn it around 90 degrees, that's your cover. Um, and most, you know, healthcare practitioners and, and patients obviously are not herpetologists. They have no idea where to begin when identifying snakes, and they're kind of in a panic or emergency situation. And so they turn to a herpetologist and they ask, you know, what snake is this? I need to know right away. Um, and and we can help them, but you know, there are a limited number of us, right? I mean, herpetologists are. It's not the most lucrative career ever, and not very many people go into it. And some of us have, do other things every once in a while. And so we may not be available right away. And we also live in different parts of the world, particularly uh, most of us live in parts of the world where snake bite is not a big problem. Um, so, you know, we kind of have laid out the problem here. I think many people, including doctors, are quite bad at identifying snakes. Um, many resources require a lot of training to use and they may contain mistakes. And the expertise, expertise in snake ID is not concentrated where the snake bite problem is. So, you know, this is a daunting problem and we kind of thought about what we could do to address this. Obviously we're not able to address the entire thing, but um, we came up with sort of a number of ideas to address these problems. Uh, you know, some problems being we don't know what snakes are biting people. We can't relate treatment outcomes to snake ID if we don't have snake ID and we need to develop better antivenoms and, and antivenoms are often quite specific um, to the species that they, uh, whose bites they treat. So that's, that's quite an important need, I think. Um, and so what we decided to do is we decided to try and quantify how well people could identify snakes. And so if you participated in our snake ID challenge, which you ran back in 2019 in February, I think it was, you might recognize this screen. Um, I picked out a thousand images of a hundred different species of snakes, 10 images per species. And over six days, we plugged this as hard as we could on social media and tried to get as many people as possible to participate so that we could measure, since we already knew what these snakes were, you know, how good were they? And then what were the important determinants of what, that were influencing their ability to identify or not these snakes? Was it something about the snakes themselves, something about the people, something about the image, uh, or something else, right? Um, and this was quite fun. You know, the only downside to this really was that I didn't get to participate because I created it. So I really, really wish that someone else would make one of these and that I could um, go in and play it. And when I say play it, we tried to sort of gamify this. So we gave people points for getting them correct. And of course, we gave them more points if they got it correct at a lower taxonomic level. So if they said, you know, if they said that this was um, uh, snouted cobra or something like that, then they'd get points for getting the genus correct, but not the species. And um, that also applied at the at higher taxonomic levels of, of the family. And so we drew um, images from different sources around um, the web, from iNaturalist, if you've used that before, um, also from Herp Mapper, which is the largest Herp citizen science database. Um, IndianSnakes.org donated a lot of images of snakes from India. And then, of course, Facebook, which is a huge source of images, but really difficult to access except for collecting them by hand. Uh, so this was quite successful. Um, <laughs> people really got addicted to it. Uh, some people really, um, you know, spent a lot of time on it, bragged about their scores, really got competitive with each other. Um, some people said, you know, I, I should probably uh, be doing something else. Uh, I couldn't believe the level of participation that we had. Um, and if you participated or if we used your photo, a huge thank you. I thought that I had some other statistics that would come up here but they're not appearing. So um, I'll have to remember them off the top of my head. I'm pretty sure over the course of six days, we had about, um, I think we had about 1,000 different participants and they submitted collectively 117,000 unique IDs of these thousand images. So the average number of IDs per image was somewhere around 100. So we had a lot of data to work with. I never collected so much data so quickly in my entire 
Digital Life. And um, we are uh, very close to publishing this now. We've gotten reviews back from a journal and we're working to make the analysis even more rigorous. And I'm hoping to resubmit that paper within the next couple of weeks. So um, here are sort of some results. Uh, this is the percentage of responses that were correct at the species level for each of the different genera of snakes that were in the treatment. I'm sorry that it's a little bit small and hard to read, but what I really want you to see is that there's a lot of variety among groups of snakes in terms of which ones are easy or difficult to ID. Some snakes are just inherently easier to ID than others, maybe because they um, look less similar to other snakes. It could also be because people are more familiar with them. We tried to tease that apart a little bit. Um, if you sort of collapse this down at the family level, you can see that vipers and boas and pythons were among the most frequently correctly identified, and that blind snakes as well as lamprophids, which are sort of African radiation of snakes that contains both very dangerous and harmless members, were consistently incorrectly identified. Um, there are some interesting outliers here. Some of the most poorly identified vipers are genera that are were sort of not even 100% clear that they were vipers for a long time before the advent of molecular techniques that allowed us to definitively place them in the viperidae. And then there's one lamprophia that is really unique and unusual. That's um, Langaha, the leaf-nosed snakes from Madagascar that have these long proboscis-like things. And there's really nothing you could confuse those with. Um, but these were some relatively you know, consistent differences, and, and there was important variation at the family level. Um, so let's, let's look now kind of at the species level. Um, another question that we had actually was more along the lines of how often did we um, see identifications that would have been really misleading in a dangerous way in a snake bite context? So how often were venomous snakes misidentified as non-venomous snakes? and vice versa. Um, you can think of this also as sort of force, excuse me, false positives and false negatives, which is something we've all been thinking a lot about lately. Um, so the good news is that both of these rates were relatively low. So 6% of harmless snake images were misidentified as venomous. So that would be a false positive. Um, the number one species in the challenge was Pliocircus illapoides, which was identified as venomous 44% of the time, and that's because it's a coral snake mimic. In fact, it's sort of notorious for being among the best coral snake mimics that there is. They're very, very close mimics of um, some species of coral snakes that they co-occur with, and they're also quite variable within um, the species, so, so they're quite tricky to ID. Um, the second most frequently uh, misidentified as venomous harmless snake was a uh, species of Philothamnus from Africa. These are sort of bright green, relatively featureless snakes, and these were misidentified as green mambas or as boom slangs. Um, and that's not also terribly surprising. There are a number of sort of one color snakes around the world, whether that color is green, black, or gray, um, that don't have a lot of features that show up easily in photographs. So you have to be really familiar with them, maybe their shape and their size in order to be able to ID them from a photograph. Um, in the other direction, false negatives, this was even lower. So only 4% of venomous snakes were misidentified as harmless. Um, the most frequent were actually snakes that many people don't really appreciate as being medically capable of delivering medically significant bites. So that includes a species of Rhabdophis, um, two species of which, Submineatus and Tigrinus, are known to have killed people with their bites, despite the fact that they are um, colubrids, so they're part of a group of snakes that, generally speaking, we don't think of as being particularly dangerous. And then um, the next uh, most frequently misidentified was a species of Atractaspis, or a stiletto snake uh, from Africa. And this is another snake that doesn't really have a lot of features, right? I mean, it's sort of like one color, maybe differently colored underneath, and there's a lot of lookalikes in the same area. Um, uh, the third most commonly misidentified as harmless species was a coral snake. In fact, it was the species of coral snake that is mimicked by Pliocircus, and so it was identified as harmless 29% of the time as Pliocircus or other species of coral snake mimic. So coral snake mimicry works, works well against humans also. Um, good, okay, just a second. Sorry, just uh, closing the door there. Um, among the sort of top identified species, so boa constrictor was consistently the most accurately identified species. 
And I've split this into the top and bottom 20% of users because um, in a minute I'll show you some other data showing this sort of spread of different people and how well they did. But the top 20% of users correctly identified boa constrictor 98% of the time. Um, we did also give people the option to say they didn't know. And some people chose that option, particularly um, the bottom 20% of users uh, often weren't sure. And that's okay. I mean, it's kind of interesting to think about how do you incorporate uncertainty into something like this when a person doesn't know or they don't know for sure. Or, you know, we, we did allow people to sort of select at the genus or family level what they wanted to report. And so you can see that on the right here, there are some species, but also some genera and some families, pythons or something like that. I've been experimenting with different ways to display these data. So this is one way that I thought I was satisfied with, and then I found a different way that I think is better. So you'll have to tell me what you think. Um, this, this is another sort of plot that shows which taxa boa constrictor are misidentified as. So false negatives for boa constrictor, right? So boa constrictor is on the right, that's the correct ID. And all of the species, genera, and families on the left um, are other incorrect responses that were given when the user was shown an image of a boa constrictor. And I tried to make this sort of hierarchical. I think I can do a better job in the future of making sort of multiple columns for family, genus, and species. And you can also see not sure in there and the, the relative height sort of tells you how many such incorrect responses there were. Um, of course, the genus boa is not strictly incorrect, but it is less precise than it could be. Um, and in this case, you know, all species, genera, and family are possibilities because we allowed people to select sort of any species they wanted. The converse of this would be false positives. So this is which species are misidentified as boa constrictor. So the response, incorrect response given is boa constrictor. The correct IDs are all of the different things that you can see there on the right. Uh, so these are false positives for boa constrictor. Um, in this case, only the 200 species that I challenge data set or possibilities. Uh, I said 100 before, so that is um, 100 species that were well replicated. And then we also had another 100 species where I had a single image each to use as distractor images to sort of prevent people from getting too used to the species that were in the challenge. We didn't use those in the full analysis because they weren't replicated, but I did include them here because I think it's interesting to see which um, taxa were misidentified in both directions. So, so this is quite cool and we can um, generate these plots for any of the 200 species that we included in the challenge. Um, some of them are a lot messier, but um, I'll just show you the ones for um, Plyocircus, the, the coral snake mimic, which was the least accurately identified species across the board. Uh, even the top 20% of users only got it right 32% of the time, 6% of the time they didn't know and they misidentified it frequently as coral snakes or other coral snake mimics. Bottom 20% of the users only got it right 2% of the time and a quarter of the time they didn't. So these are a bit tough to read because there are just so many different colors and so many different taxa. Um, but what you can see from the other plots here is that um, there weren't too many false uh, negatives. Actually, sorry, um, I said that incorrectly. So there were a ton of false negatives and the reason that it looks like there aren't as many is that I had to collapse them down to the genus or family level in order to display it in a way that could be legible. So if I had shown you every single species on the left here that was given as an incorrect response when the image really was Plyocircus, you wouldn't even be able to fit them all on the screen in a way that's, that's remotely legible. Um, so very high false negative rate for this taxon very low false positive rates. So it's not a very widely known species. It sort of only occurs in Southern Mexico, Guatemala, and Belize. So unless you came from that area, you probably wouldn't necessarily know about it. Or maybe if you had really studied coral snake mimicry quite intensively, you might be aware of it. But there were fewer taxa that were given as, um, uh, sorry, that were confused for Plyocircus in a, in a false positive sense, where someone said it was a Plyocircus, but it really was something else. Okay, so now looking a bit at the participants. Um, participants did vary quite a bit, and I, I broke them into sort of what I'm calling quintiles here because I found that that was a, a reasonable way to sort of use natural breaks in the data. So the top 20% of users really did relatively well. On average, just about 65 to 70% of the time they were getting the images correct at the species level, which is quite good. Some people you can see from the tail there were really close to 100%, and I think some of the highest were around the 94 to 95% um, range, which is quite impressive. Um, we got some feedback from people saying that they felt they grew more familiar with the taxa as the challenge went on. 
And so I'm going to show you a few graphs now that have identification accuracy on the y-axis and the image sequence on the x-axis. Um, identification accuracy is coded here as sort of a three being getting the species correct, two meaning getting the genus correct, one getting the family correct, and zero getting the family incorrect. It's not perfect because, of course, the, the distance between these things is kind of arbitrary and doesn't really make perfect mathematical sense to do it this way, but this is... Um, this is kind of the best approach I've hit on so far, and, and at the end I'll mention something else that I'm going to try to incorporate this hierarchical structure a little bit better. But what you can see is that the image sequence, so from the first time that they saw a species to the fifth time that they saw an image of that same species, different image, um, there wasn't a huge increase in identification accuracy. Uh, it's pretty modest, less than a 2% increase from the fifth time. So some people may have learned the species a little bit as they were participating, but um, I was surprised because several people wrote me and said, I really think this helped me with my snake identification. And it probably did, but uh, evidently it didn't help everybody. Next thing um, is uh, we had sort of easy and hard images. So I, I sort of arbitrarily scored these. Easy images were mostly ones where the snake mostly filled the picture, um, was the focus, you know, you could see most of the body or most of the salient characteristics anyway. And hard images were ones where the snake was not filling the picture, maybe blurry, Certain characteristics, like the head, may have been obscured. And I was expecting to see that people would do worse on the hard images. But they actually did better on the hard images. 15% um, higher accuracy on difficult images. And I think that the reason for this is that we allowed people to select whether they were going to play on easy or hard. We give them more points for playing on hard because we wanted to incentivize people to do the hard images. But I think quite a few people probably didn't. And the people that did choose to do so were probably better at identifying snakes in the first place. So um, that backfired a little bit. didn't work out quite as we planned, but um, fortunately we were able to account for it anyway, and so we can analyze the two different data sets separately if we like. Um, this is something that in the future I probably would not give people the option to do. Uh, it did feel fun and game-like, but from a data analysis perspective, it was not um, what I was hoping to see. But that's fine. Um, okay, next thing that we looked at was we asked people to tell us what global region they came from. Of course, we knew what global region the snakes came from. And so now I'm dividing this vertically into uh, what I'm calling away games. So where someone from, say, Africa would be asked to identify a snake from, say, Australia, a region that they maybe are not familiar with, versus home team advantage, which is where if you're from Africa, you're being asked to identify snakes from Africa. We had all global regions represented, and we also were fortunate to have participants from all global regions. And what you can see is that there is a pretty significant advantage to trying to identify snakes from the region that you come from. Presumably, you're more familiar with these to begin with. Um, on average, identification accuracy was about 25% higher if the snake came from the same global region as the participant. So that really speaks, I think, to the value of local knowledge and being familiar with your local fauna. Um, and I, I was really uh, impressed to see the, the strong effect size here. This was, this was quite good. Uh, I'll break this down now by family. We kind of looked at this a little bit before. So bows and pythons pretty consistently were sort of the most easily identified. And that's true whether they were um, home or, or away. And for both easy and hard images, um, about 33% higher than lamprophids and blind snakes. But the differences are not um, enormous. Um, you can see that the away versus home team is probably just about as important as the variance among families. And then finally, the global regions themselves were not inherently different from one another. We didn't find any important differences among regions. Some did have larger sample sizes than others, so that complicated things a little bit. But generally speaking, um, snakes from all global regions are more or less as difficult as those from other global regions to uh, identify. So those are sort of the results. Um, there's a lot more to do here. I'm working on kind of an item response theory analysis that better accounts for the taxonomic structure of the responses because of course it's not quite as simple as getting it right versus wrong there are different levels of wrongness like you can get it to the right genus but their own species or the right family but their own genus um, something i'm really interested in doing is uh, calculating a discrimination factor for species and individual images that will allow us to say which species and images have the greatest ability to tell high performing participants from low performing ones and those particular species and images would probably be useful as a sort of test of individuals' reliability at snake identification, which could um, allow those people to then be sort of vetted by the WHO or Doctors Without Borders. This person really is quite good at identifying snakes. We can put a number on it. Um, and then they might um, be interested in sort of helping out in, in crisis situations. 
Uh, I'd also be interested in withholding the geographic location. So we always told people where the snakes came from. I'm sure that uh, performance would have been lower if we hadn't done that. And that's something I'd like to try in the future. And of course, including more species, doing some region specific challenges and asking people to tag images. So to tell us what the snakes are when we don't already know what they are in order to generate new data sets. These are all kind of future directions for this type of work. Okay. Um, so that's kind of part one, looking at uh, how good are humans at identifying snakes. Part two is going to be about um, artificial intelligence and using what's called computer vision to uh, identify snakes automatically from images. This is a picture of uh, chess master Gary Kasparov playing against IBM's deep blue chess artificial intelligence in 1997. Um, he, uh, he was dethroned by the computer and, and artificial intelligence has come a long way since then. Um, I didn't really understand what artificial intelligence was when I started doing this project, and I'm still not sure I completely understand it, but it's it's actually a lot um, simpler and less scary than uh, than I was initially thinking. So I'll, I'll do my best to try to explain it, but please understand that this is actually not my area. So I may need to um, say I don't know if you have a question about it or refer you to a colleague. Um, so artificial intelligence is like a broad category that includes machine learning and a sub-discipline thereof is something called convolutional neural networks, which are used in um, object classification among other tasks. So you are probably familiar with one of the very early smartphone apps, um, Shazam, which was an app that would allow you to play or record a few seconds of a song off the radio. If you didn't know what song it was, it would tell you the artist and the song. And this used a convolutional neural network to classify these objects. In this case, it was an audio object. Um, but the same type of technology can be used on visual objects like images. So they can classify photographs into existing categories. Um, you do have to train them. And so um, we generated quite a bit of training data uh, using images from iNaturalist and HerdMapper and other sources. Um, and then you sort of feed the images in and, and, and you do this thing where they call it sort of semi-supervised training. So you allow the computer to kind of learn um, using kind of object detection um, algorithms that it uses to pull out pit bits of the images that it, it finds in common among classes and different between classes, if that makes sense. So it, it finds something about the image that it thinks is quite consistent among all images of, say, boa constrictors that are not shared by images of other species of snakes. And it learns that whatever that thing is means that the image is of a boa constrictor. But I said it's semi-supervised. So we supervise it by giving it labels, um, labeled images, but we don't really tell it what to look for. And in many cases, we don't really understand exactly what it is looking for. So a good example is this AI, which was trained to predict whether a particular photograph was of a wolf or a husky dog. That's kind of a hard problem. I mean, they look pretty similar. Um, but it managed to do quite well, except if you notice the image in the bottom left there. So it predicted that this image was, with, was of a wolf when, in fact, it is of a husky dog. And the reason it did this, uh, they sort of looked into this in great detail. It's become kind of a classic case in uh, artificial intelligence, is that this image has snow in the background, just like the other images of wolves. And so wolves tend to be photographed against snowy backgrounds, huskies do not. And so this um, artificial, quote, intelligence, unquote, learned that uh, if there was snow in the background, it was a wolf, and if there wasn't, it was a husky. And obviously, that's a mistake that a, a human would never make, but um, it was a good um, heuristic for this computer vision algorithm until it wasn't, right? So that's kind of an example of one of the pitfalls that can happen when you use a technology like this. And I'm still trying to understand, you know, in our images, what exactly does it hone in on it? And I really don't think I know the answer um, yet. And so that's kind of a future direction that I would like to understand this better before I would try to use it in, say, a snake bite case. So um, let's just take a quick look here. We also did this in kind of a challenge using a similar data set. Um, we gave people 82,000 images of 45 different species, and we asked them to come up with algorithms. And this is a community, a much smaller community, really, of, of kind of artificial intelligence uh, geeks, right? I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, but they really are amazing people who have incredible talent and passion for this type of thing. And so they um, submitted different algorithms, and we sort of let them compete to come kind of and um, they did come up with several quite good ones. So here's kind of the output of, of one of our better ones. Um, what you can see is kind of the actual identif identity of the different species on the vertical axis and the predicted identity 
on the horizontal axis and the darker the color, the higher the number. I know the numbers are too small to read. What you can see is that wherever the actual and predicted match, it's really quite a high number, sort of varying between, I think the lowest is about 35% and the highest is probably 97 or 98%. And there are a few other boxes there where there's, um, that aren't on that center diagonal that have somewhat higher numbers. There's some confusion among species that were not each other. But, but generally speaking, that's pretty good. So this, this algorithm demonstrated an accuracy of 87%. That's the same thing as the true positive or true negative rate in this case, because it is some sort of reciprocal between the two. And it had an error of 13%. So that corresponds to both the false positive and false negative rate. So you can see it's kind of making errors at a little bit higher of a rate than some of our human participants, certainly than our best human participants, but it's better than our worst human participants. Uh, AI people use what they call an F1 score to balance between accuracy and error. And so in this case, F1 score is 83%. So um, keep that number in mind. Again, uh, boa constrictor was the most frequently correctly identified snake across several different testing data sets that we ran this algorithm on, which I thought was quite cool because it was also the species of snake that humans had the easiest time identifying. Um, I guess there's not just, I guess there just isn't much that looks like boa constrictors. Um, they are quite iconic. Most people know about them. It doesn't hurt that the common name and the scientific name are the same probably, but uh, yeah, the, the highest F1 was 95% and the average was 94.5% for boa constrictor. And I'll just show you a few other species pairs. This is a much smaller data set because they do require a lot of training images. So um, the minimum, we had, to, we had to have at least 500 unique images per species in order to train this algorithm. So that's, that's a high threshold for many species of snakes around the world. Here's another pair of species that are frequently confused. Um, on the top is the uh, rough green snake and the bottom is the smooth green snake. These are both um, North American species that look extremely similar. And um, the algorithm did a, a decent job of telling them apart. So the highest F1 was 88%, the average was 81%. And um, I'm sure that your average person probably couldn't tell these apart correctly 81% of the time. So I think that's quite good. Um, Consistently, the worst identified group of species in this set was the black rat snake complex. So you may or may not be familiar with the idea that black rat snakes have been sort of split along um, genetic lines using mostly mitochondrial DNA into three different taxa. And I was not surprised to see that the algorithm consistently struggled to tell these apart um, because these are actually pictures of two different species. They look almost exactly the same. And uh, recently, a lot of criticism has been placed on the decision to actually consider these separate species. So we'll see sort of what the different systematists that have been arguing over this for the last few decades end up deciding to do. But what we showed here is that uh, even a very smart artificial intelligence was unable to consistently distinguish them. Um, you know, it did so on average of 63% of the time, which is much better than random, right? I mean, random guessing for a data set of this size with 45 species would be something like 2%. Right, so, so that's sub substantially better than random, but um, it's nowhere near uh, the type of accuracy that you'd like to see. Um, recently, we did look at some more medically important snakes in India and um, retrained an algorithm that is sort of specific to some Indian uh, genera that are really quite dangerous. So uh, cobras, Russell's vipers, crates, and saw vipers, also known as the big four of India, and some of their close lookalikes. And, and we're really seeing good performance with this algorithm, although you can see that um, crates and wolf snakes are still um, misidentified as one another about 5% of the time, which is really a dangerous and difficult ID to make. I certainly wouldn't be making it uh, myself. And if you want to try some of these AI tools, there are several out there. Um, iNaturalist has one that's kind of built into their app and their uh, web interface. So if you submit a photograph, it'll suggest based on the photograph itself and also your geographic location, what is visually similar. And that's that's being accomplished through AI that they've trained on a massive data set. We, we used a lot of their data also because they're HerdMapper has quite a good one too. Um, this one obviously specific to amphibians and reptiles. And so I just did a quick sort of side-by-side -side comparison of the, uh, the images in our challenge that were most often confused by the HerdMapper AI and those that were most often confused by people. And what you can see, so what, what you expect to see here is that this diagonal line, um, if the point is on the diagonal line, then it means that the image was um, identified about equally correctly by so all of these points here above the line are points where the AI um, got the image correctly identified and it had an advantage over humans. 
There are also a number of cases where the AI was very confident about the identity of these images, but it was not correct. Um, so that's a significant limitation that I think needs to be sort of addressed. And I know you're all waiting to see how many points appear below the line and how soon we'll need to sort of submit to our robot overlords. But fortunately, the good news is that humans still have a huge advantage over AI for many images, um, particularly images of low quality. Um, I think humans really outperform AI still in this area. And my AI-oriented colleagues tell me that it's just a matter of time until we get enough training data where AI will consistently be better than humans. But um, I think we need to sort of think carefully about the types of training data that we're using. A lot of training data probably contain errors themselves because some snakes really are just quite difficult to identify. And so guarding against that and really using only very high quality training data is a recommendation that I've been making since I learned more about this. Okay. Um, Future directions for the AI side of the talk, obviously we want to add more species. I'm particularly interested to see how this will do on some easily confused snakes that are all sort of one color, like some of these shiny black snakes from Africa. Uh, very difficult to get 500 images per species of these. Uh, we may look into segmenting the images a little bit finer, so asking the person uploading the image to tell us where the head, body, or tail of the snake is, that may help the AI to sort of converge on a, an easier identification. Uh, we can incorporate geographic location now into these AIs, and our first results suggest that this produces about a 5% boost, so hence the need to do an experiment with humans to see what the boost is in having the geographic location in terms of uh, a human ID. And then also integrating kind of um, the hierarchical structure and asking the, the taxonomic structure and asking the AI to predict both the species and the genus, and maybe think about collapsing the IDs to the genus level. If it's not sure at the species level, this is this is tricky because um, there's a lot of taxonomic instability in snakes, and so different species get shifted around from genus to genus as we get more information about them. New species and even new genera are being described all the time, and so um, until the taxonomy settles down a little bit more, I think it's going to be sort of putting the cart before the horse to do this because uh, we're just going to have to keep updating the taxonomy every few months, and that's going to be really frustrating for um, our colleagues in the field who are trying to treat snake bites. And then finally, um, I think that we can probably make a lot of progress through citizen science and combining citizen science and AI using tools like interactive multiple access keys. So if you don't know what that means, you might have tried the Merlin Bird app before, which takes your geographic location, the time of year, and some very basic answers to questions about a bird that you've seen, like how big was it? What were the main colors and what was it doing? And it can also take a picture as an input. And it gives you some kind of ranked predictions, very similar to what we're trying to do. And it works really, really well because there's a ton of photos and data out there on birds. Um, not as many for snakes, but we are working on increasing that. So um, that's where we want to go with this. And ultimately, we'd love to be able to offer an app to patients and doctors and anyone around the world that's interested in learning how to ID snakes that can integrate both uh, artificial intelligence approaches as well as crowdsource and expert verification approaches. And that's something that, um, you know, we're, we're using Merlin as kind of a model, but we're also trying to go a step beyond Merlin, and keeping the human in the loop, right? Because these are life and death situations, and I'm not sure I would trust a computer, even a very, very good AI, to provide an accurate identification 100% of the time. Um, yeah, so if you want to get involved, um, one of the best things you could do is take pictures of snakes or other animals if you see them and submit them mapper or iNaturalist, there are a large number of snake species around the world with no records at all on mapper or iNaturalist. You can see the maximum is there's about 150 species of Indonesian snake that have no records at all in the citizen science databases. A good fraction of species in Mexico, Colombia, Brazil, other countries, where we still need just one image, right? I mean, imagine getting to the 500 image threshold needed to train an AI for a lot of these species. Um, you can also participate uh, on AI Crowd if you have those sort of chops or in our future ID challenges, or if you have a collection of images yourself um, that you'd like to donate for us to use for training or testing purposes, we would love to know about that. Um, I say we, but I, of course, have moved on to my new position at Florida Gulf Coast University. And if you're interested in this, if you're in the audience and you're thinking about graduate school in snake ecology, or if any of this sounds really compelling to you, um, send me a private message or talk to me afterwards. I'd love to talk to you about possibly working together. I am still collaborating with the group in Geneva um, to continue to improve this. And with that, I know I've gotten quite close to the end of our sort of allotted time, although we did start a bit late. So I invite you to laugh at these silly memes about World Lizard Day and talking to your kids about ecology. And I would be very happy to field any questions that you might have.
Hey, Andrew. Nice presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, I've got a couple of questions. So with your um, ID experiment, so with the participants, did you also note uh, the level of expertise the participants had in your game? So um, we didn't, and I wish that we had. And the reason that we didn't is that we sort of, we thought about asking people to rate their own expertise, right? Mm -hmm. Back and forth a lot on how exactly we should ask them to do that, because there are a lot of people in the world that are not uh, working as or trained as professional herpetologists or snake biologists, but nevertheless have a great deal of experience and might actually outperform some of the top snake biologists in the world because they know the species so well. They do it as a hobby or they do it sort of avocationally. Um, and so we didn't we didn't feel satisfied just asking, you know, are you a professional herpetologist or not? Um, the other reason is that there are a lot of people out there that are the person, like they're the best person they know at identifying snakes, but they're not actually very good. And so we thought they might overestimate their abilities and other mm -hmm. people overestimate. Now, of course, because we didn't collect the data, we can't really answer that question. And so that's why I say I wish we had asked people how good they thought they were, and then we could have compared that to what they actually were. Um, so that's definitely something that we will be doing next time. Okay. Yeah, you could also maybe ask people uh, how many hours a week they are doing anything with snakes or thinking about snakes or something. That might yeah, that's you know, how many hours a week do you think about snakes? <laughs> yeah, you don't have <laughs> to answer the answer for myself. <laughs> uh, among this community, it's probably not uh, super unusual. Yeah. So, and with your snake uh, detection algorithm, this F1 score, um, mm -hmm. on a separate uh, uh, a separate set, was it the, the set they also trained the data on? Separate set, yeah. So yeah. Um, we didn't get into the details of that because it, it is a little bit complex and we did it a few different ways. But uh, yeah, if you would test the algorithm on the same set that you trained it on, then it would it would perform extremely well because it's yeah. seen images before so we always used separate subsets and it's kind of hard to keep a, a set of training images completely secret but we've been developing in secret a very high quality like gold standard training set and I've been particularly keeping an eye out for very difficult images that I think it should be able to identify and, and when it's able to identify those then I'll feel that it's sort of ready um, but it's hard because of course we want to expand it to cover the whole, whole you know biodiversity of snakes around the world three almost 3,800 species now and you know, you, you saw we've got data on, uh, we've got good data uh, image-wise on 45, and then we've got at least some data image-wise on, uh, we've got at least one image of about two-thirds of those species. So fully mm -hmm. a all snake species we don't even have a single photograph of. Uh -huh. that, that's kind of part three of this project that I didn't talk about. It's just the data set in general, and it, it's massive and it's growing, but, um, but snakes are obscure, secretive animals, and if particularly snakes that live in remote, rural, developing parts of the world, um, we just know so little about them and that's exciting for me because like i love to think about rare and unusual snakes but it is um a challenge <laughs> yeah, it's hard to get money for that right it is i mean that's the kind of like uh really fun field work that you'd like to do you know mm -hmm. go out to indonesia or whatever and, and photograph yeah. uh, and try to find just rare snakes or species of snakes that haven't been seen in a really long time um so that, that was initially part of our proposal and i was like yes i'll do that but uh there's too many, you know, it'd be many lifetimes worth of work. So I'll, I'll, I'll hope to participate in some of those efforts in the future. I see that Harmony put in the chat that she has a question. Do you have a set of flashcards for the most common species? Um, depends on what you mean by most common. So that, uh, that VL Herp software I mentioned includes all of the species of the Southeastern United States. That basically is digital flashcards. Um, I don't have something like that worldwide, but uh, if you're interested, I can share a little bit more detail privately later about uh, sort of how our data set looks worldwide and what are the species that are most commonly represented. Um, I also see a, a typed in, um, perhaps ask the common names is the first question, and, and yes, actually, so when we did the snake ID challenge, we tried to support any reasonable scientific name that had been recently used. So if the genus had been changed two or even three times in the last 50 years, we supported that. And um, we also supported um, common names, at least for some species in English. Uh, as another consideration is I really wanna, really wanna have an interface that supports common names in at least the 10 most widely spoken languages around the world, because many, many people that would be using this won't necessarily have any working knowledge of English. Um, uh, that's a huge job. So um, 
that's a future direction for sure. Also, he has to be somewhere else, so we locked him. Yeah, I do. Uh, thanks, Andrew, for giving this talk. It was really nice to hear about your work. Um, sure, I was you. wondering if you use these like super high quality images to train your algorithm, how would mm -hmm. that affect the performance on images that were made like in the hospital or shot during a hike and are not yeah. of such good quality because they will definitely have different backgrounds. It's true. And, and we thought about that. Um, so not every image that we use in training is super high quality. You know, I, I used some in the presentation here that sort of look quite nice, but uh, there is sort of a spectrum. You know, it, it's almost impossible in some cases to actually identify what species of snake it is if the quality is, is low enough. And so if a human can't ID it, then we can never use it to train an AI because we don't really know what it is. Um, but you're right, of course. And, and so a lot of these images that I showed, I think I'll just go back here. Then I should have shown sort of more examples, but a lot of these sort of uh, blue points here where the humans have an advantage, those are images of really poor quality, where the AI probably maybe isn't even find the snake in the image or it can't identify um, whatever feature it thinks it's supposed to be looking for. But humans are able to to, uh, zone in on, to zoom in on that, which I think is quite, um, quite interesting. And so I want to do more testing of the AI on really low quality images and try to include low quality images in the testing data, but also, as you say, in the training data. Um, there are a lot of poor images of snakes out there, but the challenge is collecting them. And uh, that's really where a special role to play, I think, and they don't seem to want to play that role. We, we spent a lot of time trying to get Facebook to grant us access to some kind of API that we could use to scrape images from particular groups that are very active in snake identification and are full of really crappy pictures of snakes. <laughs> and their API used to be open um, before the Cambridge Analytical scandal, but they closed it down about a year before I started this postdoc, and they are not really interested in working with scientists or anyone at this point uh, is kind of the conclusion I came to, which is really frustrating because they're sitting on a gold mine, and I think they know it, and they don't. They wouldn't like to share that. Um, but they thinking about these types of research questions. So I, I really hope that that would change someday. Um, who knows? I mean, if you read the news, you see Facebook's got scandals about data ownership and what they should or shouldn't do with their data all the time. So, um, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, then in the case of snakes, that might actually be quite harmless. <laughs> yeah, I, I, can't, I can't see a way it could be misused. Um, perhaps there is, but... Uh, but yeah, I think they're trying to treat everybody equally, and, and in doing so, they're sort of denying everyone access to their data, and that that may suit their purposes, but um, yeah, it doesn't suit mine. So, do, do we have to... I mean, I, I'm I'm willing to hang out for another question or two. I, I know we're sort of at the end of the time, but yeah. okay. I I have a fun bonus question if there's time. Sure. I, I was sure. wondering in in your blog um, access. Was there a Corona peak, like uh, March 2020? <laughs> yeah, and I thought about writing a new post during the lockdown or doing another snake ID challenge during the lockdown because I really thought people would um, have lots of time. So I'm just looking here. It does sort of seem like yeah, maybe like, there's a peak recently. I <laughs> yeah, I think that huge downturn is, is this month because these are uh, – these are summarized by month, and of course, June. We're only twelve days into June, so I think that's why it looks like it's so low recently. I think it is a bit higher compared to March and April, at least last year and maybe the year before. But I haven't been putting new content up there as much, so I think that's probably all right. Thanks. Probably that may have been outweighed. <laughs> <laughs> sure. So I'll answer that one first. So that would be really nice, you know, as, as a component of a future sort of app that a doctor or a patient could use. You know, our, our dream is that, yeah, we would have sort of the immediate um, AI bit, and then we would have sort of a, a slower but maybe more um, accurate consultation with someone that really knows what they're talking about. They would either verify or, or not the conclusion that the AI has reached, and they could maybe have a back and forth with questions. I mean, of course, you have to have people sort of standing by to do that. And that's that's a challenge, right? I mean, how are you going to motivate them to spend their time doing that? Um, you can pay them, but, you know, it, it's really a, a complicated global system. Um, and I think it's a bit outside of what I'm probably able to 
accomplish as a herpetologist. You know, some of my colleagues in Geneva are thinking about this and trying to to make it work. And I'm frankly skeptical because I think that a lot of herpetologists are motivated by different things um, than trying to cure the snake bite problem. It's not that I don't think they should be paying attention to the snake bite problem. Obviously, I'd like it if they were, but um, but yeah, some of them are. Um, some of them are, are busy doing other things, right? So I think that's uh, yeah, a significant challenge. What was your second question? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I should have described the dynamics of the challenge a little bit better. So um, we didn't have any time limit. Uh, we told people they could take as long as they wanted and that they could consult any resources that they wanted because we felt that that was sort of realistic for a situation where someone sent you a picture of a snake to ID and you wanted to be quite sure that you got it correct. Um, so you might, you know, check a, a website or check a book. And uh, I know from feedback that some people indeed did that. However, um, what we saw, so we timed how long it took them to submit their response. And uh, I should have shown this data as well, but I was trying to take stuff out so that I could make time and I barely managed to do that as it was. Um, uh, the, the vast majority of people, I think 95% of IDs were submitted within two minutes and 50% of them were submitted within something like 30 seconds. So if participants were consulting resources, um, they weren't doing so for very long. And my impression is that most of the time um, that was not the case. Now, there were a small subset of people who, um, you know, their times were longer or times for particular images were longer. But in general, I think people are really identifying by gestalt. They either know it or, it's, or they don't, and they make their best guess or they say they're not sure, and then they move on. Oh, uh, versus their accuracy. Um, I think uh, I looked at that a while back, and I'm pretty sure there was not. I don't think that the time to when they submitted their answer was a significant predictor of anything. So I ended up taking it out altogether because everyone was really, you know, by and large, quite fast. And that, you know, there were maybe some significant differences, but by just a couple seconds. So I, I think that even if it's statistically significant, it's not actually meaningful for you to be able to ID a snake two seconds faster. You know, that, that doesn't. It doesn't help anyone, even in a clinical setting, two seconds is nothing. Um, so, so good question. There, there's some questions here in the chat. So Tristan says, um, has anyone tried training an AI with images deliberately taken of various angles, like dorsal, ventral, lateral, whole body versus head? Um, we have not been very deliberate about that. We have certainly included images from taken from various angles. The vast majority of images are dorsal or lateral and show either the whole body or maybe just a close-up of the head. Um, We'd like to experiment with that a little bit more because, of course, a lot of snakes look really different ventrally than they do dorsally, and there's also things like ontogenetic variation, so age variation. Um, but it's hard enough to get enough images of some of these species as it is, even if you just sort of ignore that. So trying to, to narrow it down even more, it, it makes it quite difficult to reach the kinds of thresholds you need to train an AI if you, um, if you break it down by, by different parts of the morphology. So it, it's a future direction for sure. Um, I think uh, Merlin experimented a little bit with using like benchmarks on their images and they asked people to say like, where's the eye, where's the bill, you know, where are the tips of the wings, where's the tip of the tail? Uh, snakes are different in that they don't have a lot of appendages and their bodies and heads and tails can be kind of in any orientation relative to their other parts in a photo. So I'm not sure it would help as much, but um, this is an interesting area to think about for sure. Um, Harmony, who I think has left, said uh, perhaps Facebook moderators could query their members for pictures. And um, yes, we did ask a lot of Facebook moderators to do that. A lot of people got back to us saying, sure, we'd be happy to share images. And then they kind of never got really got around to it. One of the big um, downsides is that there's just not an easy way to quickly export data from Facebook itself, which would, which would be the easiest thing, right? I mean, then nobody has to ask anyone to do anything. You can just easily and quickly get the contents of the entire group. And some of those groups are really highly curated, so they have um, already taken out all the trashy images and all of the sort of viral pics and stuff that are not useful for our purposes. Um, 
She also mentioned authors allowing access to their pictures. So we did filter um, iNaturalist as well as Flickr images for their Creative Commons license. We made sure we were only using images that had been posted with a license that allowed their reuse. Uh, because we're doing scientific research, the copyright law allows a pretty broad definition of fair use. We're also not selling these images and we're not um, doing anything that would sort of prevent their uh, authors or their photographers from selling them themselves. So my understanding of the sort of various copyright laws of different countries that are relevant to this project is that we are allowed to use these images, but um, we, were, we tried to be pretty sensitive to that fact and not use images if we thought the photographers wouldn't like their images to be used. Uh, so far, we haven't really gotten any negative feedback on that, but I've tried to really get ahead of that because a lot of people really are quite protective of their intellectual property as they should be. John says, have you tested the AI on classic field guide images for fun and which field guide do you think would perform the best? So I haven't done this. Part of the reason is that it's a lot of work to get images out of field guides and there are much more strict copyright protections for published books than there are for images posted on the internet. I originally thought about using field guides as sort of a gold standard, but a lot of publishing companies were not willing to let us use that or we had to pay for it. Um, that's something that I would still like to explore because of course those are really good um, images and I suspect that it would do fairly well, but uh, we haven't really done that. And then let's see my I think comment on yeah. the previous discussion. Sorry, say again. I comment on, comment on the previous discussion. Yeah. Yeah. So the AI should be able to give you a level of confidence in its selection and you can have a human double check the low confidence ones. Yeah. And that's kind of the hierarchical approach that I think uh, Merlin uses a bit as well. Mm -hmm. um, Although you can see, uh, I'll, I'll just jump ahead to the other slide here quickly. Um, the AI misidentified quite a few images with very high confidence. And oh. that's, um, there, there are these sort of top three and top five approaches where you know the correct ID is in the top three or top five. So you can see some of these gray points here that are all the way at the top of the screen. So mm -hmm. AI species confidence level is 99 or 100%, but uh, it's the wrong species. So that's, okay. that's not good, and we want to reduce that. Um, but it only knows what it knows, right? I mean, it's also kind of got the significant limitation of if you give it an image of a species that it hasn't been trained on, it's going to tell you that it's one of the species that it has been trained on. Yeah, because exactly. you don't really know how to say, I don't know, or I think this is something that I haven't learned before. Um, and that's, that's why I think we still have a lot of work to do before this is ready for any sort of real clinical use. It's, it's really come a long way, and I'm really impressed with how well it can do on the species we've trained it for. There are a lot of rare species of snakes out there that we haven't trained it on yet. Yeah, my pleasure. You know, th thanks for inviting me, and thanks a lot for all the great questions. Um, I'll just answer John's last question really quickly. Was there a difference in accuracy between people using a computer versus mobile if this was tracked? Um, it was tracked, and the short answer is no, uh, there was not. So, so yeah, thanks again. Thanks, Masood, for inviting me and setting this all up, and thanks to you all for coming.